To really see how this estimation process works, we need to engage in something called Monte Carlo simulation. What we're going to do is simulate the process of taking repeated samples and see what kind of estimates we get. In the journal that accompanies this module, you'll see in section 3 the Simulating Variance Estimates link. Go ahead and click the Variance Simulation link and you'll be prompted to enter the population mean and standard deviation, sample size, and number of samples to draw. Let's play around with this to see what kind of results we get. I'll specify for the population mean 100 and for the population standard deviation, I'll specify 15. These are the typical characteristics of an IQ distribution. Let's start off with samples of size 5. What I'm saying here is that for 10,000 repetitions, Jump will take samples of size 5 from this population, a population centered at 100 with a standard deviation of 15. So, what we'll be able to look at is over the 10,000 samples, what types of sample estimates did we get for the population standard deviation? Let me click OK and Jump will quickly return a table with 10,000 rows showing us for each sample the estimate of the mean, the sums of squares, the variance as if we were using the population formula using n not n minus 1, an estimate of the variance when we divide the sums of squares by n minus 1 rather than n, and the standard deviation using both of those formulas, using the population form and using the sample estimate form. So our main interest here will be what types of estimates do we get on average using these different quantities. On the left hand side, you'll see some links or hyperlinks to scripts that are saved to the data table. These scripts can be run simply by clicking the red triangle and selecting run script. Let's start with the first script, which is our estimates of the population variance. I'll select run and jump will bring up a little platform that shows us histograms of the variances we observe for each of our samples as if we used the n in the denominator or n minus 1. So you can see the relation. Let me just click on a bar here and you'll see in the data table those are the actual samples we observed. So some of the time we actually got estimates of the population variance that were really small, almost at zero. And think about how this could happen if we had five individuals in a sample and those five individuals just happen to be really close to each other well, our sums of squares will be very small, and our estimate of the population variance, too, will be very small. On occasion, we also got observations that were extremely spread out, which yielded variance estimates that were very, very large. Now let's take a step back. Let me click Show Initial Settings, and remember that we specified a population mean of 100 and a population variance of 225. You didn't see me enter 225. In fact, I entered a standard deviation of 15, but remember that a standard deviation squared is just the variance. So, how close did we get to 225 on average using these different types of formulas? Well, let me go to the show on histograms and let me show the observed average variance in each of these different formulas. And you may not be able to see it too clearly, but notice that when we used n in the calculation, so dividing the sums of squares for each sample by n, 5, we got an estimate that was a little less than 200 on average. Remember, we're trying to estimate a true population variance of 225. So on average, over 10,000 samples, we actually will underestimate the variance if we use n in the denominator. Notice what happened with m minus 1. Remember, we're dividing by a smaller quantity in the denominator, so 4 in this case. So we'll actually inflate our estimates, and if you look, we've inflated it just enough to be correct on average. Another way to see this is, let me go to show on histograms and show both the observed average variance estimate and I'll show also the true population variance. If I do this, you can see that when we divide by n over those 10,000 samples, we were systematically underestimating the population variance. However, by dividing by n minus 1, remember what this means, each sums of squares for each sample is the same, but instead of dividing them by n, which is 5 in this case, we divide by n minus 1, which for any single sample will inflate the estimate just a little bit. But importantly for us, regarding the bias of the statistic, on average, that is the perfect correction such that our estimates will, on average, equal the population value. And don't forget what on average here means. On average means across all the samples we could take that our estimates will average out to be correct. 
notice there are plenty of times, even when using n minus 1, that we underestimated the population variance. And there's plenty of times where we overestimated it. In fact, anything to the right of this blue line is an overestimate of a sample, and anything to the left is an underestimate. What we're concerned with when it comes to the bias of a statistic is whether we are on average correct. And in this case, we are on average correct. To finish this off, I'll click Show Statistics, and we'll actually look at what the mean variance estimate is for each of these different formulas. If we're using n in the denominator, on average, we would estimate the variance in the population to be 180. Well, that's just wrong. That is an underestimate on average. However, by using n minus 1 in the denominator, on average, our estimates were 225.60, very close to 225. Now notice that even though we took 10,000 samples, that's not all the possible samples we can take. In reality, there are millions, billions, trillions of samples we can take. And the point is, on average, over all of them, using n minus 1 in the denominator will yield an average estimate of the variance that's exactly equal to 225. Now let's try this again with some slightly different settings. I'm going to close our sample estimates here and close the sample table. And I'm going to click the variance simulation again. Let me specify the same population mean of 100, the same population standard deviation of 15. But this time, let me do a much larger sample. So for each of the samples we take, let's imagine we take 60 individuals. I'll still take 10,000 samples. And when I click OK, Jump will return the table with each of the 10,000 samples, their sums of squares, and the variance estimates using n and n minus 1. Now the first thing to observe before we compare the variance estimates is look for any one sample. Here, this is the first sample we took, and we got a mean of 101. Notice that the difference between the estimates we get using n and n minus 1 is very small here. It's only changing the value about four points. Now this should make some sense. The difference between 60 as a denominator and 59 is not as large as the difference between 5 as a denominator and 4. Right? That's 5 divided by 4 as a difference versus 60 divided by 59. So as we get larger samples, the bias in our statistic will be less profound. And this should make some sense. We'll come back to talking about what types of means we expect to get. But at least at the outset, we talked about the mean being a consistent statistic. That is, when we have larger samples, the mean we expect to get should be closer to the population mean. So, remember that our big issue here was that whenever we get a sample mean that's different from the population mean, we will underestimate the sums of squares. So, to the degree that we're now estimating the mean precisely, the amount of correction we need to apply has to be less. Now, if we look at these variances, let me go back to the compare variances script, and I'll actually show on the histogram both right away. Notice that the amount of bias here using n is pretty small a very little amount that we're actually off. Of course, using n minus 1 will get us our precise estimate. That's what we actually want to do. But if I show the statistics here, notice that our underestimation with larger samples is less considerable. Now let me do one final demonstration here. And instead of using samples of size 5 or samples of size 60, let's use the smallest sample we can do for this type of demonstration, a sample of size 2. Notice why we need 2. In order to estimate the n minus 1 quantity, we're going to have to have a sample size larger than 1. Otherwise, we'll be dividing by 0 for some of those estimates, which won't work. Let's specify a population mean again of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Now, when I click OK, Jump will return again our sample table. In this case, look at the difference between using n and n minus 1 in our calculation. This is a difference of using 2 versus 1 as a denominator. And so you can see there's considerable change in these estimates. If I compare the variance estimates now, let me click Show Statistics and also show on histograms both the true and average observed variance, we can see that there's considerable underestimation in the variance when we use that population formula. So if we were using n as a denominator and we were taking a sample of size 2, on average, we would estimate that population variance to be 112. Remember, the population variance is 225, so we're nearly estimating half the size of the population variability. Whereas, if we use n minus 1, our correction is perfect. 
Now, of course, for 10,000 samples, we didn't get exactly 225, but if we were to do this for an infinite number of samples, our estimate of that population variance on average would be exactly 225. Now, let me do one more thing here before we leave this simulation. Let me go back to our specifications, and this time, let me do a fairly large sample. So I'll do, again, a population mean of 100, standard deviation of 15, and sample size this time, let's put it up to 100. So 100 individuals in each of the 10,000 samples. When I click OK, Jump will again return our sample table. Remember that the estimate change will be very little here. It's the difference of dividing by 100 versus dividing by 99. But instead of looking at the variance estimates, let's look at the standard deviation estimates. Now, so far, I've only been talking about variance estimates and the unbiasedness of the variance estimator. Now, in fact, we can't talk about the standard deviation as being an unbiased estimator because expectation does not compute over powers. We expect and we maintain with that n minus 1 correction that the variance estimates will be on average perfectly correct. But let me show on the histograms both the true and observed standard deviations. Notice that using n, of course, it is off. But if I expand out the scale here, you'll actually see that our estimate of the population standard deviation, even using n minus 1, is still systematically off. The standard deviation of a sample is not an unbiased estimate of the population standard deviation. It will still be a little off. Now, with large samples, that underestimation will be very trivial, and in general, this won't be an issue at all. But remember that expectation does not compute over those powers. We can't expect, because the variance is an unbiased estimator of the population variance, that the sample standard deviation is also an unbiased estimator. So, going back, notice the main insight from this section is that for us to estimate the population standard deviation or variance, we'll be dividing by n minus 1 in the denominator of our quantity. Now, as I mentioned, the standard deviation in a sample is not an unbiased estimate of the population standard deviation. That's going to be okay. But when we talk about the variance, we can say that the sample variance is an unbiased estimate of the population variance. More formally, we would write this out as s squared is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. We also saw before that the sample mean is an unbiased estimator of the population quantity mean.